Hello, everyone. Kristen, can you hear me? I hear you, Judy. Great. Sorry about the delay. How are we doing? We're all good. We're all ready for you. Excellent. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Um, we're so excited today that we have a very special guest. So you're all in for a treat. And Kristen, can you move the slides since they're not doing that for me? So thank you all for coming, and we're really glad that you're on today. Um, today's webinar is about social movements and environmental education. What's the connection? And we have Dr. Hari Han, who's the political scientist and faculty director at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Judy Browse, and I'm the executive director of the North American Association for Environmental Education. And we're really excited to offer this webinar. If you can switch to the next one. Um, and we are also doing this webinar in affiliation with our affiliate co-hosts. And this is something that we do together across North America to really advance environmental education. We're so ha happy to have affiliate co-hosts working with us on these webinars. You can go to the next one, please. Um, so for those of you who have not been on an NAA monthly webinar, it's, we are trying to do one every month. We're trying to do them on the fourth Tuesday of every month at three o'clock, but it depends on when our speakers are available. So just check on the timing, and Kristen does such a great job with the timing um, and the announcements, so just keep track. And we're trying to bring new ideas, new thinking, new people, new um, practice and quality to the field to help us all do better at what we do. And next, uh, month's webinar is about citizen science and what's new in citizen science with Mary Ford at National Geographic and Danny Edelson at the Biological Sciences Curriculum Study, BSCS. So today, quick intro to using Zoom, and then we turn it over to Hari, and then we'll have time for questions and discussions and closing thoughts, okay? So if you've never used Zoom, and I think most of you have, the way we communicate, because we have so many people online and don't want to get feedback, is to send messages through the chat bar. Um, so if you just go to the chat, you could see that Kristen already sent an email out to everyone. Please send messages throughout um, the uh, presentation as you're thinking about them, and then we will collect them and make sure Hari has them um, so that we can move forward. And if you can go to the next slide please. And I want to just really highlight the work that Kristen and Sai have done, the masterminds of the webinar series, not only organizing it, but helping on the content, helping on the technology, and just making this work. But if you have any issues along the way, please email either Kristen or Sai, and they can help you um, with anything that you're having problems with. And the next one and again, just remember to think about questions or comments because I think Hari's going to leave some time at the end so we can really have a discussion about the role of social movements. What can we learn from Hari that will affect our field, affect the environmental movement, affect the work that we are doing in environmental education to engage people? And Hari is a very, very special individual. So I want to take a minute before I turn it over to Dr. Hari Han to just introduce her because um, she has a phenomenal background. She has really helped bring her wisdom to a number of the activities that are taking place in environmental education, including our conference in San Diego and our work on the SAFE campaign with the Zoo and Aquarium Association. She is an Anton Vonk Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And before coming to Santa Barbara, she was an associate professor of political science at Wellesley College and a Robert Wood Johnson health policy scholar at Harvard University. She's an expert in the study of civic and political participation, collective action, social change, and democratic revitalization, especially as we're thinking about social policy, policy and environmental issues. She looks at the role civic associations play in mobilizing participation in politics and in building power for social and political change. She's published three books and her award-winning work has been 
featured in a number of different journals. She's involved, involved in many efforts to make her academic work relevant to the world of practice. Through her research, she consults and works with a wide range of civic and political organizations interested in organi organizing, movement building, questions about building power for social change, working with groups from the Ford Foundation to MoveOn.org to Rethink Health, and she's assisted on a number of political campaigns. She received her PhD in American politics from Stanford University and her BA in American history and literature from Harvard University. So she's a really smart, well-rounded, amazing person to have helping us think about social movements. Thank you, Hari, for being here today, and I think you're all gonna enjoy this discussion. Let's give her a warm virtual welcome. <laughs> Um, well, thank you very much, Judy, for that very nice introduction. And thank you all for inviting me to talk with you. I'm really excited about the conversation that we're going to have. Um, like Judy said, um, what I'm hoping to do is talk for the first little bit and then, um, and then maybe um, hopefully have time for some questions and discussion. Um, so I just switched the screen share. So you should be able to see um, some slides that um, I have. And while we're getting the setup, maybe we could queue up the first question. There's gonna be three questions that I'm gonna ask you all, the audience, um, during this conversation. And so, um, Kristen or Sai, I don't know if we could queue up the first question now. Absolutely, here comes question one. So if folks can see the question on their screens, if people wanted to start um, popping in answers, then we'll see what people say. Um, I can read the first question. It says, what kind of people are most likely to join the pro-life movement? And the answers are um, devout Christians, animal lovers, or environmentalists. So I'm not sure, um, <laughs> either no one's voting or I'm not seeing that, it, that they're voting. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be seeing. I see the answers coming in. We're, we're almost right at about 75% votes, and I will close okay. and share the results with you. Um, Got it. Okay, sorry. I'm not, sure how this no, works. not a problem. Looks like votes are slowing down. So I will end the poll and share the results. Okay, so 91% of people um, say, as most people do, that we think when we think of people who join the pro-life movement, that the, that the kind of people we think would join would be devout Christians. And that's... Um, you know, exactly what we'd expect. Um, but what I want to do is start by sharing with you um, a little fact, right, which is that when we think about the pro-life movement, many people, like those of you who are out in the audience, sort of think, well, who joins it, right? We think the kind of people who join the pro-life movement are people who believe in pro-life issues, right? So who believes in pro-life issues is devout Christians, right? Devout Christians are much more likely to do so than animal lovers or environmentalists or other kinds of people. Um, one of the most interesting pieces of research that I've seen is by a sociologist named Ziad Munson, who did a study of the people who are at the very front lines of the pro-life movement. So these are people that lead groups in their communities, organize their churches, attend protests and marches, and so on and so forth. And what he found was that contrary to popular opinion, half of the people who were the frontline leaders of the pro-life movement were actually pro-choice or indifferent to issues of abortion when they first joined. Now, I can't see all of you, but I would expect that this is surprising to some of you, given that 91% of you thought that it would be devout Christians who would join the pro-life movement, right? Because I think very often when we think about movements, we think that what movements do is take people who already believe in the issue and then give them opportunities for, to participate. So if we're thinking about building out an environmental movement, who should we look for? We should look for other environmentalists. What Ziad's work shows and a lot of other people's work shows is that actually a lot of people are drawn into movements for, for very different reasons, right? Not because they believe in the issue, but because a friend asked them to come to the meeting and they couldn't say no, because they just moved to a new community and they wanted to meet new people. There are all sorts of biographical reasons that draw people into the movement, but what's amazing is that the movements, when they're effective, they transform people in terms of not only what they, can, what they believe, but what they think they must do. And I think that's a lot of what I want to talk to you all about today is how movements work in terms of how they engage that kind of transformation. And so I thought that it would st I would start by just talking about how I got into doing this work. Um, for those of you who can see the slides, um, that's a picture of my, my dad's family and my grandparents. Um, on the top, they were war refugees from North Korea and they migrated south during the Korean War. And eventually my parents moved to the United States and 
Um, I was born in the United States, but my, I sort of grew up as a child of immigrants. And so the picture in the bottom left-hand corner is our family when we went to, when we went to Mount Rushmore. Um, I'm in the little orange sweater there. And um, a lot of what I saw growing up as a child of immigrants is this idea that my parents were trying to figure out, like, what does it mean to raise a family in the United States? What does it mean to raise kids who are, quote, unquote, American? And I saw them kind of really sort of remake their, their, own, their own lives, right, and remake our family in the United States. And I think the key lesson that I learned from that is the idea that transformation is not only possible, but it's a way of life, right? It's what we do. We try to remake ourselves, our families, and the world that we live in to create the world that we want for ourselves and for our children. And so that was really deeply ingrained in me. And so I think it's really no accident that I do what I do now, right, which really is I study social movements. And the reason why I think it's no accident is because movements at their core do what I was describing to you in that pro-life movement, which is that they're different from other approaches to social change in the sense that they're not trying to sell us ketchup, right? They're not trying to sell us cereal, but instead what they're trying to do is transform people's sense of what's possible. And by transforming people, they transform the world, right? And so a lot of what I've tried to do in my career is try to understand how that works. And so, if we step back and think about, okay, so what is a social movement, right? And I, I threw up here kind of a quote by Charles Tilley, who's a classic and, scholar. And um, Hari, can I interrupt you for a minute? The slides aren't changing, so. Oh, they're not. Yeah, so either we could take it back over. They weren't on my computer either. So sorry to interrupt right That's in the okay. middle. That's okay. Let me, um, you know what? I've had this happen before. Let me just sort of stop the share and then try it one more time. So I'm just gonna try the share one more time and see if it works. It's nice to see your face though. <laughs> Are you seeing? Yeah, there we go. Now it says, what is a social movement? Okay. And then I'm going to try. Are you seeing the next one? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sometimes it just takes two times to, to do the share. Um, well, so anyways, thank you, Judy, for that. Because it's helpful since you guys weren't seeing all the great pictures that I had of my family <laughs> up there. Um, but what I was saying is that if we think about what a social movement is, um, you know, this is just a quote that's a, defin that's a definition from Charles Tilley. who sort of says that, you know, social movement is a series of interactions between power holders and people claiming to speak on behalf of, those, of that constituency, in which that constituency tries to make public cl claims, right, for demands for change, essentially. And I don't want to get into the technical sort of technicalities of that, but in my mind, the core thing to understand about a social movement is that we need social movements when we're trying to solve the problems that are the stickiest problems for us to solve in our world, right? Because it turns out that building a social movement is really hard. And if we could fix the problems that we had by developing a clever message or by creating a new piece of technology or simply giving people information, then we should do that because it's a lot easier to do those things than it is to actually create a social movement. But we need a social movement when what we really have is a problem of what I call a problem of power. And hopefully you guys are seeing the next slide now where the way that I'm defining problems of power are that it's basically a situation where people who want the change the most lack the power to make it, right? So maybe those people are our children, our grandchildren, or people who live in frontline communities who are facing environmental changes, you know, other, all sorts of people who want the change or whatever that change is, but they don't have the authority to make it, right? And so what a social movement does essentially is it creates a, um, a movement through which people who want the change the most figure out how to work with others to acquire the resources they need to make the change that they want, right? How do I turn what I have into what I want? Well, I do that by building a movement that shows me how to reconfigure the resources I have to turn it into what I want. And so one thing that um, I just wanna be really clear about is sometimes when I talk about it in terms of problems of power, you know, it feels a little bit scary, right? Because we, we generally think of power as being this oppositional thing, right? That I'm trying to force you to do something else. But the way that I think about power is that power is a relationship. Right? It's an exchange of interests and resources. So I have power over somebody when I have a set of resources that they want. Right, Those are their interests. They have power over me when they have a set of resources that, that I want. Right, Those are my interests. And so what creating power means essentially is when people agree to exchange their interests and resources, th th exchange their resources so that they can help each other's interests. And we can do that cooperatively or we can do that oppositionally. And I think commonly in our politics, we think about doing that in oppositional ways. But a lot of what social movements are about are about creating that exchange cooperatively, right? That I decide, you know what? I can't make the change that I want. I can't create the environmental movement that I want alone. So I have to agree to work with others, right? To exchange our resources so that we can together create the kind of movement that we want to see. 
And so there's a famous organizer um, in American politics named Saul Alinsky, and he once said that when you're working on problems of power, you have two choices, essentially, because there are two sources of power in American politics, organized people and organized money. And if you're not on the side of organized money, you should be on the side of organized people. And I think in a lot of ways what social movements are is there are situations where, you know, when you have a constituency that doesn't have the ability to make the change that it wants, it's trying to figure out how can it tip the scale, right, so that what the people want, right, what the sort of this broad group of people want is begins to sort of be the change that we see. So how does that work? So when I was first starting to look at this question a few years ago, um, I was looking around and sort of feeling like there's kind of this funny paradox sometimes that we see in the world, right? So in the 21st century, we're fortunate to live in this moment where it's easier than ever before to get people involved, right? We see these viral kind of outpourings of activity where more people can take more action more easily than they ever have been before. But the paradox was, was that when I was talking to a lot of activists and leaders in the environmental movement and elsewhere that were on the very front lines of this work, they were saying that they felt like they were more powerless than ever before, even though they could get more people involved than they ever could in the past. And so what I want to do is sort of try to figure out, well, what's at that paradox, right? Why is it that we can get more people to take more action, but that's not translating into the kind of power that we want to make the change that we need? And so I went around and I studied a bunch of environmental organizations in the United States and trying to compare those that were sort of really good at engaging people and, and <clears throat> creating the change that they want versus those that weren't as good and trying to see what was different between them. And what I realized was that, um, you know, the differences between the high engagement and low engagement organizations, they weren't accidental. There were some pretty clear systematic differences between them. And so before we kind of get into them, I want to ask another question. So if we can pull up a second poll. Um, and so the second poll is going to ask you about um, um, which organization you see as being more powerful. So if I were to sort of put before you the Sierra Club and the NRA, which is the National Rifle Association, which one do you see as being more powerful in American politics? or in our world? Votes are coming in. We're at about 60%. Give a few more seconds for votes to come in. Okay, here come the results. And so, oh, wow, so this is really imbalanced, right? So 93% of people say that they see the NRA as being more powerful than the Sierra Club. 7% of you are optimists out there and seeing the Sierra Club as being more powerful. And so that's really telling to me, right? Because in a sense, the question is, well, what is it about the NRA that makes them such a powerful organization? So let me throw another fact out there. So I grew up in Texas, like I told, uh, my parents are immigrants and then we grew up in Texas. And this is a fact that's not at all surprising to me having grown up in Texas, but might be surprising to those of you who live in other parts of the country. There are, four, there are about 15,000 more gun stores in America than there are grocery stores, right? So if you think about all the grocery stores that you see walking around in your neighborhood, I mean, if I think about my own neighborhood, I can come up with sort of five grocery stores that are really near my house right away. There are 15,000 more gun clubs in the United States than there are grocery stores. Now, why does that matter? Well, I think it's no accident that the, those gun clubs and those gun stores are such a core part of how the NRA builds its power, right? Like among the people who are on this webinar, we had pretty wide agreement that the NRA is way more powerful than the Sierra Club. But what, what makes it so powerful? And part of what I want to argue to you is that the NRA is one of these organizations that does a really good job of using these um, places where people gather, like gun clubs and gun stores, and engaging them in the kind of transformational work that the pro-life movement does that we talked about in the beginning of this webinar that allows them to sort of build the power that they have, right? The power that we all perceive when we think about these organizations. And so the way that they do that is that organizations can use different ways of engaging people and when I was doing my research on this project, what I found was that there's a real difference between what I would call transactional mobilizing and transformational organizing. So what's that difference? So the easiest way to describe that difference is to tell you a story. And the, the picture that you have on your screen is a picture of a young man named Alex Waters. Um, and Alex Waters, I think he grew up in Colorado, but I'm not positive about that. But he went to Iowa for college thinking that he was going to be a professional golfer. So he goes to college thinking he's going to be a professional athlete. And one weekend, his freshman year, one of his friends says, hey, you know, my parents have this lake house. Do you want to come out with us for the weekend? So he thinks, great, that sounds so fun. So he goes out to the lake house for a weekend. 
And um, he's standing out at the end of the dock one night, and it's a little bit windy, and he has a hat on his head, and the hat blows off, the wind comes by, it blows the hat off his head into the water. And he thinks, shoot, you know, I really like that hat, right? He wants to get his hat back, and he looks down at the water, and he thinks, well, you know what? The water's probably only about 18 feet deep, so I'm just going to dive in and get that hat. So he dove into the water thinking it was about 18 feet deep, but it turned out it was about 18 inches deep, right? And you can imagine what happened, right? He snapped his neck. He was life flighted out of there. It was in instantly quadriplegic, and his life changed overnight. His dreams of becoming a professional athlete were over, and he had great medical care. He fast forward a few years, and he's back in Iowa for college, and all of a sudden, the Obama campaign is recruiting him to become an organizer. And he says, are you crazy? There's no way that I can be an organizer, right? I can't do any of the things that organizers are supposed to do. I can't knock on doors. I can't dial phone numbers. You know, I can't even turn on the lights in the office or grab paper off the printer to get a walk list. So I can't be an organizer. And the Obama campaign says, no, no, no. I mean, they don't use this terminology, right? But in my mind, this is what they said, right? They said, we don't want you to do the kind of traditional mobilizing that we think of most organizations doing where what you know, what, where, what most campaigns doing, where what they do is hire a bunch of young 22-year-olds, go out and knock on every door and call every person that they can. Instead, we're going to run a different kind of campaign, right? And the campaign that we want to run is one where we're going to do transformational organizing. And what that means is the job of the organizers that we hire is not to make all this voter contact. Instead, what it is is to identify and develop the leadership of people who live in that community and then ask those people to sort of talk to their neighbors and the people around them, right? And that's how we're gonna sort of build this campaign. And the difference between what Alex thought he was gonna do and what he ended up doing, that's really the difference between mobilizing and organizing. And Alex, by the way, turned out to be one of the most productive organizers in the Obama campaign, because he was so good at developing the leadership of people who lived in these communities. So what's the difference between mobilizing and organizing? Well, one way to think about it is that in any organization, right, environmental organizations or political campaigns or what have you, there's an activist ladder, right? And there are more people at the bottom of that ladder than there are at the top, right? And what mobilizers do is they sort of say, wherever you come in on that ladder, we'll match you with an opportunity for involvement, right? You can self-select where you wanna be. So if all you wanna do is affiliate with our organization and get on our email list, great. Like we'll put you on our list and we'll send you emails, right? If you say you wanna come in and volunteer in our office for an hour a week, great. Like we'll create work for you to do an hour a week, right? If you say all you wanna do is is engage with us on social media, great. Like we'll create social media opportunities for you to get involved, right? And so the process of mobilizing is really a search process where what organizations are trying to do is search for people out there who are ready, motivated to be engaged with them and then match them with opportunities for involvement in the organization. The difference is, is organizers say, wherever you come in that door, right? Wherever you come in on that ladder, we're gonna match you with an opportunity for involvement, just like the mobilizers do, but then we're gonna cultivate your agency to try to push you up that ladder. So if you thought you were gonna come in and just affiliate that with that organization, we're gonna to try to engage you with the organization so that we can push you up that ladder in a new way. And there are some really clear ways that they are able to do that. Um, and the reason why this matters is that the difference between what mobilizers were able, what organizers were able to do that mobilizers couldn't, is they were able to reach people who weren't just the low-hanging fruit, right? And so if you allow me to kind of push this metaphor, I'm sure further than I should, right? You can imagine that for any kind of activist organization, there's a tree, right, with fruit on it. And the easiest people to engage are the people who are the low-hanging fruit, right? And, and that, they're not easy to engage, like don't get me wrong, right? A lot of organizations spend a lot of time trying to engage them, but they're the people who are already environmentally engaged, right? They're people who understand the importance of conservation, who are on, on our side, let's say, ideologically, right? And what you have to do is find them, right? And then match them with opportunities for involvement. Those are the low-hanging fruit, right? But what the most successful movements do is they not only do that work of mobilizing, they also do the transformational work of organizing so they can reach people who are not just low-hanging fruit, but the middle and the high-hanging fruit, right? The middle and the high-hanging fruit would be people who may not necessarily think of themselves as environmentalists, right? Who maybe agree with environmental issues, but don't really understand how they can get involved or why anything that they do would make a difference. And what organizers do in the same way that the pro-life organization did, um, did that I talked about and the NRA does through its gun clubs is that even if people might come in the door because they just moved to a new community and wanted to get to know new people or because they just bought a new gun and they want to find a place to shoot it and the local gun club is the best place to shoot it, even if they come in for apolitical reasons, 
what they do is engage people in a series of relational activities where they put people into relationship with each other, either digitally or not digitally. And then through those relationships, try to transform both people, both pe people transform people both in terms of what they believe and what they want to do. And there's an, and, and organizations, as we see through the examples that I've given you with, with the NRA and the pro-life movement and so forth, they have an enormous capacity to do this, right? That we often in our politics, I think what we do is underestimate the ability of these kind of civic organizations to transform people's capacities. And the difference between mobilizing and organizing, which I'm happy to talk about more in Q&A, um, is not just semantic, right? It's not just that some organizations say they do mobilizing and other organizations say they do organizing. They were, you know, what, what I observed is that they were actually different in terms of how they structured themselves, what kinds of asks they made of people, how they communicated with their members, right? Organizers were constantly trying to find ways to put people into relationship with each other, whereas mobilizers were trying to get as many people as possible to do as much stuff as possible, which meant having them work alone, right? Because it's a lot easier to work alone than it is to work with each other. Um, you know, I'm a professor at the University of California in Santa Barbara, and my students always groan when I tell them they have a group work project because who likes group work, right? Because it's a pain to work with other people. But it turns out that we don't become transformed alone. We come transformed when we're, when we're in relationship with each other. And what was really interesting to me about the work that I did is that the organizations that were the most successful at engaging people in the kind of movement activity that we're talking about, it wasn't that they did just mobilizing or just organizing. It was the organizations that did both. Right, and the reason why you need both is because mobilizing gives you breath, right? It helps you get your scale, but organizing gives you depth. And a movement needs both, right? You need a depth of leadership, but you also need to reach lots of people. And so being able to com combine both is a lot of what organizations do. And so the last thing I want to talk about before um, I shut up and let you guys ask some questions is this question of, well, so if we think about movements in this way, right, as being this sort of coordinated effort to try to give voice to a constituency, to make claims on, um, you know, on the public sphere, then what role do environmental educators play in that? And um, I want to give you one last question before we um, get into that. And so if we can just pull up the third question. Okay, so the third question, um, oh, I think it's missing the first letter, but the third question is um, the Tea Party protests, this is a true or false question. I have a son who's really into reptiles right now and he goes around asking everyone that we meet um, about true or false questions about reptiles. So it's, you're lucky I didn't give you one of those. Um, but okay, here's a true or false question. The Tea Party protests emerged spontaneously in 2008, 2009 as a reaction to the economic crisis and Obama's attempts at healthcare reform. People can just take a few minutes to answer that question, then I will um, talk about that in a minute. Results are coming in. Sorry about the typo, that was my mistake. <laughs> oh, no, it's not a big deal. <laughs> All right, we're at 65%. Give everyone a few more seconds to cast their vote. Okay, here come the results. Okay, so 17% of people said that they thought that was true and 83% of people said that was false, great. Um, and in fact, it is false, right? Because the Tea Party protest, in fact, did not emerge spontaneously, right, in 2008 and 2009. Instead, they were the outgrowth of a lot of work that came before them, right? And so I just want to describe a little bit about that work because I think it's very telling to think in, in terms of thinking about the role of environmental educators in this space. So um, there's, this is work that's not my um, research, it's work by Theda Scotchpole, who's a professor at Harvard. And one of the things that she's done is she studied the evolution of the Koch network, which is one of the networks that really supported the growth of um, a lot of organizations like the Tea Party. And what's so interesting is that what she found is that when the Koch network was trying to develop out its network, they didn't start by developing a grassroots arm, right? Instead, they started in the 1970s by developing this series of conservative think tanks, the Cato Institute, the Koch Foundation, the Institute for Justice, right? Where a lot of what was going on in these think tanks is they were really trying to develop an ideology and an understanding of what is our view on the world, right? How do we think about how, what kind of world we want? How do we articulate that in terms of a shared vision or ideology? And then in the 1980s, they began to develop these organizations, Citizens for a Sound Economy, the American Energy Alliance, you know, other organizations like that that sort of said, okay, now that we have this developing ideology about small government, you know, about the role of regulation and, gov and 
yeah, markets relative to government regulation and things like that. How do we translate that into actual policies, right? And they created these policy think tanks that were responsible for developing these actual policies, right? And then once they had this ideology and the policies, then they began this sort of like education campaign. So the Koch seminars and the chambers of commerce, a lot of what they did was they began to go into people's workplaces, right? Um, one in four American workers say that they've been mobilized for political activity through their workplace, right? Completely legal, right? And so employers can go and, and ask their employees to attend these educational seminars about the importance of a free market ideology or an independent energy system or whatever it is that they, that they might, might want to call it. And so the Koch Network was very systematic about sort of using those educational opportunities as a way of beginning to spread their ideas. Right. And then they started these grassroots groups that became the foundation of the Tea Party, the Americans for Prosperity, FEMIS, these other organizations, so that when the economic crisis happened in 2008, you know, when the um, um, Obama's began to pass sort of health reform, try to pass health reform in 2009, the Tea Party didn't come out of nowhere, right? They had been sort of educated into this sort of framework of thinking about the world, right, that, the, that, they, that, the, that these grassroots organizations began to build on. And so I sort of say that by way of saying that in some ways I think that the work of educators like people who are on this call I think is more important now than it's ever been before because what we're finding is that we're in this moment of tremendous political, economic, and social uncertainty, right? The economy is changing, our politics are changing, the world is changing in ways that no one can really quite understand or make sense of. And what research shows is that when people are in moments of uncertainty, right? We as human beings, if we, if we um, aren't pushed in other directions, our tendency is to sort of like balkanize, right, into, into our own homogenous communities and to sort of be with people who are like ourselves. That's what we do as humans, right? And what counteracts that is when you have organizations, right, like zoos and aquariums and schools and teachers and civic organizations and places like the role that the gun clubs are playing for the gun movement, right, when, is when you, what counteracts that sort of tendency for us to balkanize is to sort of have organizations that create spaces, right, and create ways for us to develop a different understanding of the world, right, where it's not just me my, alone, but it's sort of me in connection with the world around me, it's me in connection with the communities that I live in, right, so that people begin to see how we're connected with each other, but that only happens when you have institutions that sort of create that. And so in some ways, I feel like the moment that we're in is sort of this moment where we're trying to, where we see this outpouring of activity, but the challenge is how do we turn unity in the face of resistance into the unity in the face of a common purpose? And that common purpose, I think, comes through the kind of educational work that, um, that you all do. And the challenge I would say is that I feel like um, environmental educators um, like yourselves have this enormous opportunity because you have so many people who come to you, um, not necessarily because they're interested in conservation and environmentalism, although some of them are, right? But you have people like my five-year-old who is obsessed with reptiles right now, right? And he's taking, he's dragging us to like every reptilian exhibit that we can possibly find in a hundred mile radius, right? Because he's really into reptiles. And, you know, there's just this enormous opportunity to sort of begin helping people see, right, how the sort of reptiles that they're observing sort of connect us to the world around us and sort of what, the, and how we make meaning of this uncertain world that we live in. And so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to talk with you guys. Um, and I will pause now and see if you have any questions. Hi, Hari. We've got a number of questions. Um, whoops, let me just, um, just change for a minute. Hold on for a second. Um, Michiko, first of all, she asked what the name of the expert on social movements and theory change was. Um, so if you can... Um, uh, well, so the, per the person I quoted is a, a gentleman who just passed away named Charles Tilly, T-I-L-L-Y. Great, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Michiko also asked, we don't transform alone. We become transformed when we are in a relationship with each other. Could you explain a little bit more, especially as it relates to education pedagogy? Sure. Um, so I am no expert on education pedagogy. <laughs> so um, I don't want to step on, I'm sure that you all are much more expert than I am. But um, what I'll say is that, you know, when we think about the kind of um, transformation that we need to build in people for them to become kind of active in our civic communities, right? 
um, what, what do we need to do? Well, sometimes it might be sort of helping people develop different understandings of different issues, right? But a lot of it is about helping people feel like, you know what, if I take an action, I can make a difference and I know how to make a difference. Um, and that's about developing people's agency, right? Uh, Martin Luther King famously defined people's agency as your ability to, to achieve purpose, right? Do I have the capacity to achieve my purpose, whatever that purpose might be? And what we've learned over time is that citizens aren't born, they're made. And the way that they're made is when they are in relationship with each other. So when I um, join with other people in my community to garden, right, when I meet other people to um, go bowling, right, to drink beer, to do all these different kind of things, a lot of what I'm learning are the skills of navigating with each other. And what research has found is that that process is really important because what it does is people's own self-interest becomes transformed into community interest, right? So by working on the garden with other people in my community, mm -hmm. I stop thinking about some things in terms of just what I need, but instead think about things in terms of what we need, right? And so that kind of, um, so, so that kind of relationship building is part of what's core to making any kind of democracy work, and especially when we think about it in the context of movements. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. And uh, another question was um, the relationship between social media and the personal organizing. It sounds like the people to people is critical. Yeah. And how do you think about both of them in terms of your advice to the it, both environmental movement broadly and environmental educators? Yeah. Um, so one clear. Thank you for asking that question. One clarification I should ask is that I should mention is that um, a lot of times when I talk about the difference between mobilizing and organizing, people think of that as a difference between digital and in person. And that's actually not correct, right? So you can do mobilizing in person and you can do it digitally. And you can do organizing in person and you can do it digitally, right? And so it's more about this question about are we trying to just select people and, and match them with opportunities for involvement, that's mobilizing, or are we trying to sort of transform people, right, and push them up this ladder of engagement, that's organizing. And, um, you know, what I saw was that the most creative organizations out there were, try were figuring out how to use digital tools and social media um, to engage people in the transformational work that we've known how to do for generations now face-to-face, -face, right? So if I can sit down with lots of people, then I know a lot about how to engage them in this transformational process. The challenge is it's really hard to do that at scale, right? I mean, there's only so many people I can sit down with. And so the question is, how do we do that at scale? And that's where digital tools come into play in a big way. Um, and I think the very forefront of civic technology is a question of how do we use digital tools to do that transformational work? And I've seen organizations do super creative things. So for example, there was one organization that was trying to do a letter to the editor campaign. And they set up a digital tool. They sent out an email to everybody asking them to write letters to the editor. But what they would do is if I signed up from Santa Barbara and said I want to write a letter to the editor, then they would match um, me with someone else from Santa Barbara who had signed up and ask us to work together to write a letter. And they would give us a template and they gave us talking points and did all the things that mobilizers do. But then just that act of having me work with someone else in my community, even if we did it completely virtually, what we found was that it made people more likely to stay involved over the long term as opposed to just do, getting involved once and then never doing anything else again. So there are lots of creative ways, I think, to use social media and digital tools to do that. Um, and social media also allows us to sort of take advantage of people's social networks because we know that a lot of the ways in which things spread is through people's social networks. Um, so, Hari, we have another one from Abby Rusky. Um, thanks for your presentation. What do you feel is the most current effective social movement today anywhere in the world? And what are the key elements of these that both reflect and depart from those that we think of? you know, like the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, et cetera? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. It's hard for me to identify kind of one movement that I think is the most effective. Um, you know, I think there are, you know, certainly all over the world, we're seeing this outpouring of movement work, both on the right and the left. And, um, you know, I think the reason why I hesitate to... Um, to sort of name one is that I feel like movements tend to be really diverse conglomerates of different things. And so, you know, depending on which part of the movement you're looking at, you might, you might see different things. But here's, here are a few examples. I think, for example, the, immigrants rights, the immigrant rights movement in, um, in the U.S. Um, has done a lot of really um, important work in sort of bringing voice to that constituency. Um, I think some of the um, 
protest movements in the Middle East that we've seen have done um, a lot of amazing work in sort of creating this whole constituency within some um, politically very conservative countries. Um, what are the key elements that, that are different from or similar to other historic movements? I mean, one of the things that I found so interesting in my research is that even though the technological and information environment that we work in is so different, and obviously the, we're in a kind of unique political moment right now, the sort of structures of the movements were very similar now to what they have been historically. Traditionally, we think of movements as having three parts, story, strategy, and structure, right? What is the story or the narrative for, for, for what you're doing? What's the strategy for how you're going to achieve your aims? And how do you structure yourself to do it? And what we see is that in terms of story, strategy, and structure, the same kinds of things are the same across movements now and historically. Just the sort of tools they have to implement them are obviously very different. That's great. Um, we had another question. This is, this is interesting about, you know, is there an organization or group that environmental educators or maybe the, the environmental movement as a whole can rally around? What, is, what has your advice been to the environmental movement besides the, this grassroots organization and using yeah. you know, some of the things that you've talked about? What have yeah. you been advising on? Um, so that's a really good question, and it's a it's it's a big question. Um, and um, well, well, so let me let me sort of say two things. Let me tell you one story first, <laughs> a historical story to um, anchor this question, and then let me turn back to it. So um, I think I've talked to Judy about this in, in the past before, but I'll sort of um, Judy will forgive me for repeating the story. So there's this woman named Frances Scott Willard who was an organizer um, around women's rights in the late 19th century. And she was responsible for starting the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which is one of the organizations that um, successfully organized the grassroots in order to pass a constitutional amendment for prohibition, right? And so for those of you who know your, your um, American government, right, it's really hard to pass a constitutional amendment. You need a supermajority in both houses of Congress and a supermajority of the states to ratify the amendment, yet she did it, right? So how did she build a movement to do it? The way that she built the movement to do it is she traveled around the United States talking to people all over the country. And what she would do is sort of say, well, if you want to join the movement, the first thing you have to do is swear off alcohol, right? It's that personal pledge to sort of be consistent with our values. The second thing to do is I want you to join with other people in your community to shut down a bar in your community, right? Not because anyone, whether or not sort of any one bar in any town USA was open mattered to passing a constitutional amendment, but because she wanted people to have that opportunity of working with each other, right, to learn the power of collective action. And then wh whether, win or lose, whether or not you shut down that bar, once you did that, then she invited you to join the national movement. So by the time people joined the national movement, you had this sort of group of people that all understood the value of collective action and how it worked. And in some ways, I think the big challenge for the environmental movement right now is what's the Joe's bar? You know, what's that thing that we all do together where we learn how we need each other and how to work together, right? And I think that environmental educators in some ways, you know, by drawing so many kinds of people to the zoos and the aquariums and the schools and that kind of thing, you guys have this opportunity to be Joe's bar that no one else in the environmental movement does, right? Or that few people in the environmental movement do. And with that base, right, that becomes the base through which you then can build this sort of national movement. Now, who's going to emerge to be the leader of that national movement, I think right now is still really unclear. Um, there obviously are a lot of great environmental organizations who are doing a lot of really important work, but I don't think it's yet become clear sort of which one is kind of rising to sort of be able to lead something like that at the scale that we need. Um, another question is um, related to the fact that this election surprised people on a lot of different um, counts, the fact that a lot of people didn't vote, mm -hmm. and also the fact that the environment was hardly mentioned at all, yet we feel, I think many people in the environmental movement, that there are a lot of people who care about the environment. There have been polls after polls. So there seems to be a disconnect between what people care about at the voting booth versus what we hear in elections, mm -hmm. and how we can you know, think about that, those of us who care about the environmental movement and how it relates to social and economic issues, what we can do. From your, I mean, can you just fix everything, Hari? Yeah, I know. So in two minutes, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, that's like, that's a really big question and a, and a really um, important question. I think that, um, 
you know, so to relate it back to what we're saying, like part of what we're seeing is that we're in this situation where so much of the politics that we have, the electoral politics, right, which is sort of the kind of big structure of the politics that we have, um, operate in really transactional ways, right? That if we think about the difference between sort of the mobilizing and the organizing, you know, most political campaigns nowadays, what they're doing is they're mobilizing people, right? They're trying, they're trying to go out there, they're trying to find people who already support their candidate for whatever reason, right? Give them the information that they need to make sure that people sort of shift out into one side and then um, activating them for, for action. And what, what ends up happening when you sort of only engage people in transactional ways is that, um, first of all, you get self-selecting groups of people who engage, right? And when you have self-selecting groups of people, it, it gets really polarized like what we have, right? Second of all, you, um, you end up with this gap between sort of elections and polls because the elections aren't necessarily capturing a sort of broad um, representative sample of people who are actually out there. And so there's all sorts of distortions that emerge. Um, there's some really interesting research, for example, that shows if we do like a meta analysis of all the kind of geo get out the vote work that campaigns do, right? We generally think of get out the vote as being a really good thing, right? Because what it does is it improves democracy by engaging more people. What we find is that get out the vote works really well for people who are um, mo the people who are most likely to get involved, but it doesn't do a good job at all of engaging people who are traditionally marginalized in our political system. Right. And so what we're doing by doing all this transactional get out the vote work is we're increasing the distance between voters and non-voters. Right. Or if we don't want to think about it in like terrible terms, what we're doing is increasing the distance between people who engage in our public life and our democracy and people who don't. Yeah. So for the environmental movement, I think one of the big challenges is, you know, you know, if we think about that low-hanging fruit, right, the environmental movement has already gotten a lot of that low-hanging fruit. My hands are fixed up now. The environmental movement has gotten a lot of that low-hanging fruit. Now it's got to figure out how to get that medium and high-hanging fruit in order to sort of like really kind of build the movement that it needs. And, and, and that just won't work with the transactional kind of electoral politics that we have. And so that's where I, that's where I feel like environmental educators and, and other movement organizations have a real opportunity to, um, to, to, to reshape the way that we think about what how politics works. Yep. Thanks, Hari. This is this is really hard stuff, and I think everybody is trying to figure out what the best next steps are. We had one last question here from Angela Vincent, who said, "Can you speak to the role, if any, crisis plays in social movements?" Crisis plays an important role. Um, you know, um, the thing about crises is that we never know when they're going if, if I'm, to, if I'm planning a social movement, right, I can't predict when the crisis is going to come, right? When is the next big oil spill going to happen, right? When is there going to be the next big climate event that's going to shine attention to um, climate change? You know, when, you know, when is there going to be another big police shooting or an election like we just had in 2016, right? These are all things that we can't necessarily predict. But all of those crises play a really big role in kind of sparking movements, right? And the challenge for movement organizations is when that moment comes up, how do you turn that moment into a movement, right? And so when there's this crisis that comes up, how does that moment become this sort of broader movement? And for organizations to be able to do that, they have to have a set of strategic capacities, right? It's kind of like building, it's like exercise, right? You have to build that muscle, and so even in moments when we are in crisis, organizations have to be building that, that kind, those kind of capacities, right, so that when that moment comes, they can, they're ready to act, right? And, and building that muscle a lot of ways is that transformational work, right? Because up and down, the, throughout the hierarchy of the organization, you want to have people who are ready to act when those moments arise. And so you have to sort of build up that sort of leadership capacity and push, keep pushing people up that ladder. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna ask um, Sai or Kristen if I missed any questions, if you have any additional ones. Those are all the questions I saw. They were great. And such good answers, Hari. You have just such a great way of painting the answer so that, you know, just this idea of building the muscle for the future. Um, we have a lot of work to do, as we could see in the progressive movement, but also in terms of our work um, in environmental education and what we can do, even though we are, we are not political in the sense of we're bipartisan, we're trying to make environment not a political issue, it doesn't mean we don't have a role in building this movement and trying to figure out what role we have compared to all our colleagues 
we're getting so many comments saying, thank you, thank you, great webinar. Um, any closing words for us, Hari, before we let Kristen wrap it up? Yeah, well, first of all, let me just say thank you to Judy and to Sai and to Kristen who helped organize this and for inviting me to come and talk with you. It's been um, great fun, so I really appreciate that. Um, and just on this last point that Judy made, um, you know, I, um, I think one point that maybe I didn't make as clearly as, as I had hoped is, is this idea that in some ways, what we find is that movements are built on the foundation of organizations that are not political, right? That a lot of these organizations that we now think of as being the foundation of movements, they didn't start out that way. And so um, a lot of times, especially because of the kind of polarization and stuff that, and the bitter kind of politics that we have, people don't want to engage in politics for very, very good reason. And there are a lot of reasons why organizations that are, that, that are civic organizations shouldn't engage in politics for good, for good strategic reasons also. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a role to play, right? They're, they're just so important. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all and um, look forward to hopefully more ongoing conversation. Thank you so much. And uh, the last comment here, great webinar. You are fantastic, insightful, knowledgeable, and a great speaker. I hope you will help us in the future. Um, and thanks for all the work you do. You are fantastic. Thank, thank you, you, thank you. And I'm going to um, turn it over to Kristen. You're hearing a virtual applause, Hari, but thank you so much. Thanks, Hari, and thanks, Judy. Uh, we'll just take the last five minutes um, to, to do some housekeeping. Um, just for your information, we will post a recording of Hari's webinar on EE Pro if you know anyone who wasn't able to attend today or for your future reference. You can find today's webinar and all of the archived webinars from our monthly series under the Learning tab. We will also send all registrants a follow-up email that will have a link to the recording and instructions for how to get started using the discussion forums on EE Pro, which is something that we hope you'll do. We hope you'll take to the discussion forums and keep this, keep this important conversation going. And just as a reminder to mark your calendars for Tuesday, July 25th at 3 p.m. Eastern, We'll be hearing about the role of citizen science in creating a more impactful EE movement. Um, so we'll be joined by Mary Ford, the Senior Manager for Citizen Science with the National Geographic Society, and Danny Edelson, the Executive Director of the Biological Sciences Curriculum Study. That'll be a great webinar, so we hope to see you then. And just as a reminder that as part of our monthly webinar series, we generally plan to host webinars on the fourth Tuesday of every month. There is some flexibility in that scheduling, but generally towards the end of the month, keep an eye out for those dates. And we would love to hear from you about what you'd like to learn in the future through our monthly webinar series. So please let us know if you have ideas for future topics and presenters, and stay tuned to EE Pro for details on future webinars in the series. So in addition to our July 25th webinar, you can also pencil in September 6th for a webinar about biodiversity across the globe with Eric Dinerstein. If you can spare five minutes, we'd love to have your feedback on today's webinar and the webinar series in general. Sai is going to paste a link to our short feedback survey in the chat box. We'll also send this link in the follow-up email that you'll receive tomorrow afternoon. We do hope to make these webinars as useful and as relevant as we can for you, so please do let us know how we're doing and who else you'd like to hear from in the future. So thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you in July. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.